a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as the netherworld or high as the sky. But Ahaz answered, I will not ask, I will not tempt the Lord. Then Ahaz said, Listen, O house of David, it is not enough for you to weary people. Must you also weary my God? Therefore the Lord himself will give you this sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. Verbum Domini. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised previously through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel about his son, descended from David according to the flesh, but established as son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, through resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received the grace of apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the Gentiles, among whom you are also, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all the beloved of God in Rome, called to be holy. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verbum Domini. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundo Matteo. Gloria Tibi Domine. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. Verbum Domini we are in the last uh, week of Advent. This is the fourth Sunday. Christmas is soon coming, and we're preparing and meditating upon these great mysteries of our faith. And today, we have presented to us the virgin uh, conception and birth of our Lord. The first reading today is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and it takes place over 700 years before Christ. And Isaiah is giving this prophecy to King Ahaz, that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. King Ahaz reigned in the northern kingdom from 736 to 716 B.C., 700 years before Christ. He was known for his apostasy and religious compromise. And at the time, Assyria in the north was threatening all of Israel, but immediately there, the northern kingdom, and the neighboring countries were forming a pact, a coalition, to defend themselves from this invasion, And Isaiah's message to Ahaz was trust in the Lord. Don't put your trust in worldly powers in this coalition. And we see that Assyria comes down, crushes the coalition, and then threatening the northern kingdom itself. And that's when this prophecy occurs. And Ahaz makes this pretense. I don't want to put the Lord to the test. You know, I'm not going to ask for this sign. Uh, But it's really because he doesn't want to trust in God, right? He wants to have this worldly security, trust in human strength, and Assyria comes in and crushes everybody, right? The northern kingdom's invaded, the ten tribes are hauled off into captivity. That's the end of the ten tribes, two survive. And uh, so it was a disaster. It was um, an image of lack of faith, you know, that if we do not trust in God, you know, we suffer from that. So that is contrasted with the gospel today. Ahaz disbelieved, Joseph believed. And this is the fulfillment of this prophecy given to Ahaz, that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall name him Emmanuel. You know, Matthew you know, quotes this today in this passage, you know, Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Trust in God. He's with you. He'll fight your battles for you. He is your strength. He's not abandoned us to sin, but he's come down to save us. That's the message. He's come down to save us in Jesus Christ. 
So Joseph today, St. Joseph, was challenged to believe, right? He was betrothed to Mary, but before they came together, as the tradition of that time was, there's a betrothal, and they're still separate, and then they come together. And in that time of separation, Mary was found with child through the Holy Spirit. And this was, we know this, through the the Annunciation scene in Luke's Gospel, where the angel Gabriel tells Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That's the doctrine of the virginal conception. She conceives not by the power of man, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadows her. She conceives in her womb the Word made flesh. It's a fulfillment of the prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall name him Emmanuel, God is with us. So, shall conceive and bear a son. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas said this gives evidence that her virginity is not just for her conception, but also virginity is maintained during and after the birth of our Lord. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. She's virginal uh, throughout. And Joseph uh, believes this. Remember Elizabeth, after that annunciation scene in Luke's gospel, when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, she believed, right? What does she say when she meets Mary? How have I deserved that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Who am I that the mother of God should come to me? In like manner, the humble, the just one, Joseph is known as a just man, meaning that he's faithful to the covenant, He believes and fears to enter into union with Mary in this exalted holiness. St. Thomas would teach that he decided to, as some translations say, put her away quietly, not because he suspected of fornication or that she committed adultery, but out of reverence for her sanctity. Right, I think we can all understand this, right? If you know a holy person and somebody tells you something about them, you don't believe them, right? Because you know their sanctity, you know their virtue. John Paul II and many other church fathers said the same thing. You know, saw St. Joseph this way, that St. John Paul II said he decided to draw back so as not to interfere in the plan of God coming to pass in Mary. And then he's told explicitly in a dream by the angel not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. So he gives this obedience of faith. It's his enunciation. It's his test to believe. And personally, I think if he suspected her of adultery, he'd be angry, not afraid. You know, most men would be pretty upset, right? And this is fear. He's withdrawing from this incredible mystery that's taking place due to his own humility and his own Uh, feeling unworthy to participate in it. The church attaches great theological meaning to the virgin birth. This teaches us a lot. We see in the Old Testament many examples of barren women who conceive by a miracle intervention. It's not a, a virginal conception, but they're made fruitful. And this is a sign in the Old Testament of poverty and availability to God's plan. Right? Mary says in her Magnificat, you know, he raises up the lowly. So that's the image we see in the Old Testament, that God's bending down to Israel to make her fruitful, the barren one. And we see that personified in different Old Testament women. So, but this is something new and even greater, right? The virginal conception. that She's conceiving by the Holy Spirit. But the message here is that to be fruitful, you know, we have to open ourselves to God's grace, to his work. It's only by his power that we can truly bear fruit. So the message here as well, the catechism outlines theological points taught by this virgin birth, that Jesus obviously does not have an earthly biological father. He's the son of God and the son of Mary. So this protects the doctrine of the incarnation that Jesus is truly God and truly man, that God is his Father by nature. You know, Mary was the instrument that linked Jesus with the whole of humanity. You know, the Catechism goes on to say that the virgin birth shows that this is God's absolute initiative. Right? Our salvation is that you know, God comes down to us while we're yet sinners to save us, to raise us up. 
that Jesus is the new Adam who inaugurates this new creation, this new work that he's doing in us, that he is the fullness in whom the whole deity resides, and that through him we receive grace upon grace, that he ushers in the new birth of children adopted in the Holy Spirit through faith. Right? That's what our sanctification, our justification is, is being born from above, being born of God, right? having his Holy Spirit work in us from above. So that's what we see in this virgin birth, that it's beginning in Mary. We see also the whole spousal character of the human vocation you know, in relation uh, to God. It's fulfilled perfectly in Mary's virginal motherhood. We had the reading recently from 2 Corinthians 11, Saints Paul speaking to the faithful, I betrothed you to Christ. Right? We all have this spousal stance of receptivity from Christ, that we are the bride, he is the bridegroom. Mary's virginity is also the sign of faith, virginal, meaning that it's unadulterated by any doubt. Uh, it's, you know, doubt would be like a, an adult, committing an adultery because she has this pure faith. It's also a sign of her undivided gift of self, dedicated to God. God is her spouse. She's totally committed to him. What a powerful message for us as well, you know, to put the kingdom first. And I, as I've been preaching this Advent, that struck me this year so strongly is that what this season is about, you know, just putting God first, preparing for his coming. You know, is, are we placing the kingdom first in our life? Are we distracted by other things? Are we putting it first so much so that we're waiting for his coming and we're looking forward to his second coming? That that's what's driving our life, that that's the values, that's the goal. You know, sometimes we can lose sight of the goal and it, it, you know, we, lose, we get distracted down here and it affects what we do in the here and now when we lose sight of that goal. So she is the symbol and the most perfect realization of the church and the church as the church fathers taught had the had her the church had her first beginning in the virginal womb of mary that that same holy spirit that overshadowed mary is at work in our own baptism that, that same holy spirit brings new life to our souls and in mary we see the great mystery of the church that the church, through preaching and the sacraments, through baptism, brings new life to souls, that we are adopted by God's grace, that we become God's children, that Jesus is born in the hearts of the faithful. You know, he's, he dwells you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit in our heart, and that the church herself is a virgin and mother. She's dedicated to God, and she is a mother, and that she brings forth life, supernatural life to souls, receiving the word of God in faith. So the great mystery of the church is seen in the union of the divine and human nature in the womb of the virgin. That is what's being, that mystery that happened in Mary is being repeated in us individually through the church. So in Mary, the church became the virgin mother of God. St. Augustine <clears throat> would teach that if the church is to remain faithful to her vocation, a virgin she is, and so may she ever be. What he bestowed on Mary in the flesh, he has bestowed on the church in the spirit. Mary gave birth to the one, and the church gives birth to the many, who through the one become one. All right, so Jesus is, is joining us, he's, he's connecting us you know, to himself. We become members of his mystical God, body to make us one, that we may become sons in the Son. So Mary, as Vatican II said, is a type of the church, a, pre a prefigurement, and she stands out in an eminent and singular fashion as exemplar of, of both virgin and mother. And we know she is our spiritual mother given to us from the cross, that she assists us in our salvation, prays for us, intercedes for us, where Eve believed in the serpent, Mary believed the angel, and brought forth Jesus, the firstborn, among many brethren. She cooperates in our supernatural birth with a maternal love. John Paul II said that you know, she gives 
the church a maternal face. She, as the church father said, is the personification of the church, that we experience the church's love through her, that she has not laid aside this maternal role as she assumed into heaven, but is praying, interceding for us, being a mother to us, to bring us to Jesus, to bring this new life, to impart this new life to us. John Paul said that she is a mother in a concrete and personal way towards every person redeemed by Christ, in a concrete and personal way. So the church's motherhood does not uh, make Mary's motherhood superfluous, you know, but she acts in and through the church and she helps us to prepare for Christmas. You know, Advent is certainly a, a season so close to Mary, so we need to ask her help, you know, to pray the rosary and ask her intercession to help us to prepare in a good and holy way for Christmas, that we may truly rejoice in the coming of Christ and the birth of his new life in us.